Greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, we thank you for joining us uh, for another in our continuing series of virtual curator spotlights. And today is the fourth in our series of spotlights where we look at a starting nine of artifacts. So we have throughout the museum starting nines for each of the 30 major league franchises. What we've been doing with these virtual programs is we've been picking kind of division by division, two artifacts from each of the teams. And today we're gonna to break down the five teams in the National League Central, the Cubs, the Reds, the Brewers, the Pirates and the Cardinals. And we'll highlight spotlight uh, at least, uh, well, two artifacts from each of the teams. And we'll do that with uh, Gabrielle Augustine. Uh, Gabrielle joined us a number of times last year for virtual curator spotlights. And today she joins us for the first time for one of our uh, starting nine programs. Gabrielle, it's been a while. How have you been? I'm doing okay. Thanks for having me, Bruce. It's nice to be back. Now, I know that you're a, you're a baseball player. You're a pitcher. The weather is not exactly conducive to that. Um, <laughs> things have been difficult for a variety of reasons over the last 12 months, but you think you'll have an opportunity to play ball shortly. Spring won't, won't be that far away. I'm hoping uh, that it's been, you know, just tossing the ball around outside is not really enough. So hopefully get some games in this year with the local league. Uh, but for now, you know, I guess I just have to settle with snowballs uh, yeah. and practice my aim that way. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we want to remind folks that uh, we couldn't do these programs without the generous support of the Ford Motor Company. They are our sponsor. We thank uh, them for supporting us and for uh, giving us the resources to do these programs. Uh, again, the starting nine must see artifacts from the National League Central today. Gabrielle, we're going to begin with one of the more historic teams in baseball, the Chicago Cubs. And this is one of the older pieces that we feature among any of our starting nine artifacts for any of the 30 teams. This is from the early 1900s. And it's what we call a championship fob. We had John O'Dell explain this, and he explained it very well. Our listeners understood completely what a fob was. I, I only got about 50% of it. I didn't quite understand. I'm, I'm a little bit slower. Explain exactly what a fob is and what's the significance of this item for the Cubs. Yeah, so a fob, uh, you know, back in, back in the day, uh, with World Series wins, uh, teams didn't get rings. That didn't uh, start until the 1920s or so with the Yankees. Um, but instead, teams gave out fobs or, in a sense, uh, charms. Uh, and so these charms, you know, could be attached to, say, a pocket watch chain, mm -hmm. um, things like that. And it was just another accessory to show that, yes, the, the owner of this fob played on a championship team. Now this specific Bob is from the 1907 world championship Cubs. Uh, so it was their first win, their first world series title in franchise history. Um, and yes, it's actually really, it's, I love this piece because it's so gorgeous and it's tiny one and a half inch diameter that it is. It's really not that big. Uh, but if you take a look at it, you can see the cub or the bear uh, mm -hmm. holding a diamond in its mouth, uh, and that it has a ruby eye, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, and so each of the members of the Cubs, the winning Cubs team, uh, got one of these fobs. This particular fob was actually given to Jimmy Slagle. Uh, he was an outfielder, uh, and he actually he batted 273 during the series. Um, and uh, then after, uh, once he died, it was a bequest to us um, after his death. Uh, so that's how we have it in our collection, which is really cool. Uh, the series itself is also pretty interesting because uh, it was five games, but the first game was a tie uh, because due to darkness, it went 12 innings and it ended in a tie, three mm -hmm. to three. Um, this was before uh, before lights on the fields. So you played until it got too dark to, play, to see the ball. Yeah. Um, but then the Cubs swept uh, the Tigers in the next four games. And that's how they won their first world championship. Gabrielle, you mentioned there's a diamond. Mm -hmm. We see the, the bear about to bite into. We see the, the ruby eye as well. 
What about the main material? Is that a bronze or something else? I believe it's a bronze. Um, I couldn't find information on it. We don't have that documented. Uh, so I'm pretty sure it is a bronze though. Uh, it looks like it's very finely done. I mean, the, the, the way the words, not world champion, but world's oh. champions yep. are, yep. With are an apostrophe. Blatant. Yes. Yep. You know, you can see uh, the tiny little uh, apostrophe right between the D and the S. So yeah, it's world's champion, champions. We can make out the year 1907 faintly mm -hmm. under the bear's mouth. And yeah. that's uh, that's actually a globe uh, that's yep. behind it as well. Which makes sense because it's the world. Yeah. Yep. Also interesting, you've got on either side of the fob, you've got the baseball and the crossed bats. Mm -hmm. That yep. was kind of a common logo that was used in yeah. a lot of different ways. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a great symbol for baseball, you, you know, these bats and balls. So, yeah, this was, this is really cool. And, you know, the, the team was, uh, had a really great season in 1907. They, uh, uh, went, uh, 107 wins and 45 losses, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. But actually, I mean, they actually did better in their 1906 season where they went 116 and 36, wow. but they lost the world series that year to the White Sox. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, also with this team was, uh, managed by Frank Chance the uh, player manager of Tinkers to Everest to Chance fame. Yeah. So, yeah. So th there's a ton of uh, big name people on this, on the 1917. You said the height of it, about an inch and a half? Yep. It's, it's about an inch and a half in diameter. So not, not, not too big. Now, even though it's made of a substantial metal, I imagine it has some weight to it. When you or any of the other curators or when any of the other collections people are handling an item like this, even though it's metal, you've still got to use white gloves, correct? Oh, yeah. We definitely wear gloves um, to try and we basically we don't want our hand oils or anything else to damage it. So the best thing is to always protect our hands uh, while handling it. In terms of where this is, because all of the artifacts, all 10 that we're going to look at today from the NL Central, they're all somewhere in the museum. I'm going to have to guess this is in the, the ring case that's featured in Autumn Glory up on the third floor. That would logically be where it is. Am I right or wrong? You are correct. All one right. for one. All right. That's a good now, way to start it off. This one was pretty easy. This one was pretty <laughs> obvious. So it is under glass, but you can see it quite clearly uh, when you look in that case. Um, the majority of the items are rings, but uh, as, uh, as Gabrielle said, that didn't really begin until the 1920s and 1930s. Didn't really yep. be a tradition until the 30s. So there are pendants, watch fobs, uh, other kinds of items to commemorate these championships. So that whole mixture is represented up in the Autumn Glory exhibit. So that's one of our Cubs items. Gabrielle, our second is from more recent vintage. Yep. Uh, Hall of Famer that we're both familiar with, uh, Andre Dawson. Mm -hmm. And this is a cap that he wore during, well, probably his best season, 1987 with Chicago. Yeah. I mean, this, he had a fantastic season in 87. Um, he uh, not, he led the big leagues uh, with 49 homers and 137 RBI. So not just the National League, but also the American League. Yeah. Um, and uh, he earned a goal a also his gold glove award a silver slugger award and his mvp award all in one season so he had a really really awesome season and he wore this cap uh don't have a specific date for uh when he wore it um but he definitely wore it in during the 87 season um and so that yeah it's just really cool that we have that representation he didn't i mean you know if you look at his 21 year career uh, he only, he spent the majority of it with Montreal, but you know, he did make a huge difference when he was with the Cubs for six seasons. So it's really a fascinating story because he practically had to beg to get a free agent contract. Yeah. Uh, yeah. this was at a time when teams were not offering players contracts later determined to be collusion. So mm -hmm. Dawson, it was during spring training. So this was in March. This was pretty late in the proceedings in 87. And he and his agent approached uh, the Cubs general manager. I think it might have been Dallas Green at the time and basically said, uh, we're going to give you a blank check and you put down whatever you feel is fair, as long as it's the minimum salary or above that. <laughs> and he basically ended up signing a contract for um, a relative pittance at the time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, but he wanted, I mean, the key thing, he wanted to make sure he played. So, and I think he reaped the rewards from that season a bit. Yeah, he went to a Cubs team that uh, needed an outfielder. Uh, it was a good mm-hmm. situation for him to get off the artificial turf. Yep. In Montreal, to go to the natural grass in Wrigley Field, he found Wrigley very much to his liking. Mm-hmm. Gabriel, when I look at this this cap, um, I know it's only a photograph, but it strikes me as being in, in excellent condition. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't see any threads coming off of it. It looks almost pristine. It is pretty pristine, but it's definitely uh, definitely worn. Um, you know, Usually you can tell that a little bit more in the brim. Uh, you, you'll see a little more uh, sweat marks, things like that. Uh, but we, I mean, it depends on the player and depends on how often the player switches out his cap. Uh, you know, some, some players don't give it up, you know, all season long, like Clayton Kershaw, like his cap by the end of the season is pretty gross. Um, I don't know what Andre Dawson's habits were in terms of switch having, getting a new cap, things like that. But, you know, yeah, he definitely wore it during the 87 season. So. Just I'm not sure exactly what date and yeah. how long the span of time it was. I'm not sure if you saw the underside of the bill. Do you remember if he had his name stitched in or written in? Um, I don't think so. I could be wrong, though. I don't remember. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that's nice about the Cubs is that, you know, this basic cap and these uniform colors, the blue and the red, have essentially not changed much over time. Okay. I mean, they're pretty much the same now as they were back in 1987. Uh, I remember 1987. Of course, I'm much older than you, but it was 33 (laughs) years ago, which is hard to believe. It doesn't seem that long ago, but yeah, almost. I guess I shouldn't uh, tell you that I wasn't around in 1987, Hubbers. Yeah, I kind of knew that. And and I think our viewers probably know that too. Uh, (laughs) I've been around a while, but I do remember the summer of 87. I was actually working at a radio station at the time Oh yeah, and it was kind of it was kind of fun because back then the Cubs still played a lot of their games in the daytime, mm-hmm. and I had the afternoon and evening shift. So you'd go in and you know you'd see the ticker tape, uh, which came you know this was before internet, before we had everything computerized, and over the ticker tape you'd see the results of the afternoon game. So those Cubs results would be coming in during afternoon drive and during our talk show at night, and it was fun to keep up on players like Andre Dawson, and he was fantastic, as you mentioned. Led both major leagues, home runs with 49, RBIs with 137, uh, won a gold glove, silver slugger award, National League MVP, won just about every award that you could possibly yeah. win yep. at the time. Now, in terms of where this cap is, that's going to be a little bit trickier. Um, a couple of possibilities. Uh, we have the, the lockers up on the third floor, your team today. I suppose it's possible but they, they tend to be more recent players. So I'm not going to go with that. Um, I'm going to go a uh, third floor, one for the books, our records room. That's I guess that's where it is. Ooh, yeah, not, not this time. Now I'm going to give you a strike one there. It's in whole new ball game. Oh, yeah. the second floor. Whole new ball game, 1970, the current day. That makes yep. a lot of sense. Yep. I'm trying to think if we have video of Andre Dawson up there. We have video of so many players, but I can't. Oh, there's so many up videos up there. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I, it's been a while since I've, I've walked through that exhibit. All right. So for people who come to the Hall of Fame, you'll see the cap on the second floor uh, in the whole new ball game exhibit. That's sort of right off the Viva Baseball exhibit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of my favorite exhibits. Uh, you guys did a great job putting that together a few years ago. It's just it's wonderful, and it's one of those exhibits that constantly is being added to because it's 1970 to the current day, and each yep. year more and more is added to it. Yep. So those are our two uh, representative artifacts for the Cubs, the Dawson MVP cap from 87 and the 1907 World Championship fob. Let's move on from the Cubs to another team in the NL Central, the Cincinnati Reds. Here we have a vintage glove from a pitcher that is somewhat forgotten today, but was a very good pitcher in the 1960s, a guy named Jim Maloney. Tell us a little bit more about this, if you would, Gabrielle. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, this glove he wore uh, during uh, the 1965 season. Uh, he actually wore this for his no-hitter on August 19th. Uh, this is not the uh, – was, he was 
This was his second time going uh, almost to getting a no hitter, but this time he actually got it uh, earlier in the season. Uh, he had almost no hit the Mets, uh, uh, but he lost it in the 11th. Uh, so, but this, for this game though, on August 19th, uh, he went the, the distance, uh, went 10 innings. So it still isn't like a nine inning game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he struck out 12. Uh, over those 10, in- 10 innings, but he also walked 10. Um, so nowhere near a perfect game. It was just a no-hitter, <laughs> which is yeah. still nothing to sneeze at. Um, uh, he threw 187 pitches during his wow. outing, which is unheard of today. Um, uh, yeah, and he uh, he held the Cubs hitless. It was actually against the Cubs. Uh, he held them hitless for the, the entire run. Um problem was at the same time you know uh, the Reds were also not hitting and scoring runs so it wasn't until the top of the 10th that his teammate uh, Leo Cardenas uh, actually hit a, a solo shot uh, and then he was able to finish off the bottom of the 10th inning and uh, get his no hitter and a win. The number of pitches is what jumps out at you 187. <laughs> ridiculous now, amount of pitches. Yeah. Yeah, back then, you know, they didn't necessarily keep track of it every game like they do today. Right. Um, at some of the uh, the websites, they actually have a pitch count estimator mm-hmm. where they actually they can look at a box score. They look at the number of hits, the number of strikeouts, the number of walks. Yeah. And they kind of give you a neighborhood guess of the number of pitches. But we know pretty specifically that he threw 187 for this mm-hmm. game. So yeah. somebody was counting it from the start. That, of course, as you said, would not be allowed today. Today, the outlier has really become 120, maybe 130. Maybe, maybe, yeah. 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 And if you're left out there beyond 130, you know, they're they're calling for the manager to be fired. Uh, (laughs) So totally different era, but this was a pitcher's era in baseball history. Mm -hmm. And pitchers who were pitching well were expected to go the distance, as Maloney did. Now, what strikes me, Gabrielle, about this this glove is from the mid-1960s. Mm-hmm. but it kind of looks a little bit older. It looks like you might have had this glove for a while. It's pretty well worn. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's pretty well worn. And, you know, it just it, I love gloves as artifacts because they're so personal to the player. Like, it, because it's, it, it's literally an extension of their arm um, that so every player treats their glove like, like we talked about with Andre Dawson's cap. You know, they have different views on how often they switch out hats. Same thing with gloves. I mean, and, you know, it takes time to break in a glove. It takes time to get its mold to really how you want it to be on your hand. Uh, I know the glove I have, I have, I've had that glove now for five, six years now um, that I have. And, uh, and I love it. It's, it's just, it's just perfect now. Um, but yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if he wore this in previous seasons. Um, I haven't, I didn't go look at any earlier photos to see. Um, but it's entirely possible. Um, yeah, it's a very cool glove. It's a McGregor model. Really interesting. Mm-hmm. Because most players had Rawlings at this time, but McGregor yeah, yeah. was another very popular company. And I'm not even sure if they still exist to this day, but, uh, uh I, I'm not sure if they make gloves, but I think they still exist. Okay. Uh, yeah, they were certainly one of the competitors, but Rawlings was usually number one. Most of the, yeah. Most of the kids in my neighborhood had Rawlings gloves, but hey, McGregor was good quality too. Um, you cannot see the McGregor labeling on here because of the the discoloration in mm-hmm. the palm. For those who aren't necessarily diehard baseball fans, Gabrielle, what what causes the the blackening of a glove like we see here? What's I mean, what's responsible just, for that? Just working it, just the, the constant use. Um, if you're as a pitcher you're, you know, going and turning the ball in it. So any grime, anything from the ball is going to get on there, you know, hand oil, anything. Uh, okay. It's, it's just, it's showing wear. That's just when you beat up leather, it, it gets its nice aged look. Uh. <laughs> now you're a pitcher. Yeah. When you're holding the ball, either getting ready to pitch out of the windup or the set position, where do you tend to hold the ball? Do you hold it in the webbing? Do you hold it lower? Where where exactly is the ball? I, a lot in the webbing that gets too deep in the pocket. Okay. Um, so I do it a little bit, not but not down at the palm, like bottom of the palm either. It's, it's a little bit right in between. You know, that's okay. my sweet spot for me to, to move my hand to get the grip I need. Yeah. Whatever pitch I'm going to go and throw. 
Now, here at the Hall of Fame, we have baseballs for a number of no-hitters. Not everyone, but the vast majority of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of gloves from no-hitters. So that's one thing that I find really cool about this. In terms of where it is currently on exhibit, uh, since it is a no-hit glove, I'm going to have to guess it's in one for the books, third floor. You are correct. All right. You are correct. Yep. Excellent. And I imagine we probably have a baseball from that game as well. Uh, probably if we have the glove I didn't I forgot to completely check our records and see if we do but I wouldn't have I mean if you know uh Maloney was kind enough to donate his glove I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't have a ball yeah a lot of players not willing to give up a glove from an event like this it's a it's a well yeah like like we said it's it's it, it, because it's this extension you know you really it takes up a lot it takes a lot to to give it up but that's why, and that's one of the reasons, one of my favorite artifacts when we get them. I love getting when yeah. gloves get donated. Love it. Love it. It's always tempting to put them on, but we're not supposed to do that. So no, no, we're not. We, we keep them out of our hands, but yes. uh, we do take uh, good care of them. So the Jim Maloney glove is up on the third floor in uh, one for the books, uh, which years ago was known as the records room, but then it was completely redone. Uh, and really a very colorful, uh, very entertaining exhibit, also interactive with computer uh, touchscreens as well. So Jim Maloney is the old time red represented today, a red of more recent vintage and a player that I'm sure is familiar to just about everybody watching today, Ken Griffey Jr. And here we have a helmet uh, that he used back in 2004 when he hit a milestone home run. Yep. Uh, there's lots of interesting features about the helmet. I want to get to those in a moment. Uh, but tell us first about the significance of the home run itself. Well, I mean, you see it right there in uh, his signature is home run number 500, uh, which is a pretty big milestone, as we know, to, to get to. Um, and so, yeah, June 20th, which was Father's Day, 2004. Uh, yeah, uh, he hit a uh, line, a shot. Um, it was over the right field wall, uh, and he was in St. Louis, so it was an away game. Uh, and his his dad was actually in attendance, so that's a pretty good Father's Day nice. present, you know, to see your see your son hit five his five hundredth home run. Um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, like I said, it was a beautiful Father's Day. Uh, the Reds were already up five nothing when he hit it, uh, so it wasn't a game changing home run, but a career changing for Ken Griffey Jr. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was a long it was not long time coming because but uh, it, it had taken him a week like when he hit home run number four ninety nine it was mm. a, a week earlier so I'm sure as a player you know thinking about the pressure in you know, the mental state in your head with that like I'm sure that that was probably getting to him like you know when he was going to hit number five hundred so I'm sure that was also a big relief at the same time yeah like, an awesome feeling but also relief that he did it. Griffey's interesting because he was so good early in his career with the Mariners. Mm -hmm. Some people thought he was going to break Hank Aaron's record. Of course, it yeah. ended up being Barry Bonds. But a lot of people thought it was going to be Griffey. He had some injuries during yeah. the tail end of his career with the Reds, bounced around with some other teams. And he settled, if you can use that word properly here, 630 home runs, yeah, but well so short cool. of the 700. <laughs> Yeah, just 630 home runs. Still yeah. pretty good over a 22-year career. Yeah, I just... want to talk about uh, the helmet. A couple of things jump out at me here. This was after the Reds had kind of switched their color scheme. For many years, the Reds basically, they used a red and white color scheme. Mm -hmm. Here they've introduced black, so it's a black and red. So it's kind mm -hmm. of very distinctive from that era. And then, as you mentioned, it's got the mention of the 500th home run. Griffey, I assume, signed it. Yep. And it looks like he did it in some kind of a, a metallic pen. If you I believe, yeah, it's probably, that. probably a metallic Sharpie um, mm. for that big of a brush stroke. Um, we, you know, we never asked for our artifacts to be signed. Um, but I, I'm sure when he donated it to us, he uh, just like, this is just so cool. And so he made sure to, I he probably notated everything that he was wearing at that time to be, yeah. <laughs> I'm just guessing. I don't know that, but I would hazard a guess that he probably signed his jersey, his pants, you know, everything. Um, but yeah, he was, he kindly donated his helmet to us. 
Um, yeah, so, and, you know, it came with a signature. So you can see it when it's on exhibit. You can see that signature bright and clear. Typically, how well does that kind of a marking on a helmet hold up over time? Um, well, it's on plastic. So plastic is a, it, we're still as, uh, in terms of conservation, plastic's a, a fun little, a fun thing that we're still learning about because we're learning about how it degrades and things like that because it's such a relatively new uh, material and yeah. there's different variations of plastic. The Sharpie itself, um, it's going to be fine. Um, it's, I'm actually, I think the Sharpie will last probably longer, you know, the foam on the inside of the helmet probably will go first before the, sh the Sharpie. Because yeah. <laughs> oh, foam has a way of self-destructing without even touching it. Yeah. There is a lot of foam where the uh, the air flap is, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. also under the uh, uh, the crown as well, and that that you think will deteriorate over time. Yeah, uh, yeah it's just a, that's a the nature of the foam beast, as it were. Uh, it's a bear for museum professionals uh, because it's there's not a whole lot that can be done at this point, um, but we just try to keep the temperature, you know, you know, the safe temperature, so that we slow down the decay. Well, I'll tell you, with the, the signature itself, it, it looks great. I mean, oh, yeah. it's, it's nice to see a helmet, but then to have it personalized with a beautiful, very elaborate signature, it really just kind of completes this piece. <laughs> True. I mean, but again, we, for as from a curatorial side, I don't necessarily need that artifact to be signed because the artifact tells the story itself, yeah. um, unless there's a specific reason for the autograph. But generally, we don't, we're, we don't need them autographed. So we don't ask them to do it. It's something no. they might do it on their own. Yep. But even if the, even if they do, we don't. Not, we're not going to rub it off. No, no. We're going to keep it no. on. Them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, last question on this. I'm trying to figure out where this artifact is currently on exhibit. I was thinking maybe one for the books again, but then I thought, you know what? It's 2004, so it's recent. I'm going to say whole new ball game, second floor. You are correct. Whole new ball game. Okay. Yep. Well, I learned from my previous mistake. <laughs> so second floor, whole new ball game. You can see uh, the Griffey helmets, home run number 500 against the St. Louis Cardinals at the new Bush Memorial Stadium. All right. So that's the, those are the two artifacts for the Reds. Jim Maloney from the 60s, Ken Griffey Jr. from the early 2000s. Let us now move on to the Milwaukee Brewers. And before we tell you about this one, we have to give you a little bit of a caveat. When we um, break these down, we often look at the city designations. The Milwaukee Brewers as a franchise have only been around since 1970. They were the Seattle Pilots for one year, 1969. The franchise was then purchased by Bud Selig, now a Hall of Famer, after that season. And the franchise was relocated beginning of 1970 to Milwaukee. Now, we do have an actual Brewers artifact a little bit later on that we'll talk about. But when we're doing these um, starting nines, we look at the city's history. And in this case, we have something that predates the Brewers franchise. This takes us back to the era of the Milwaukee Braves and a pretty good left-hand pitcher named Warren Spahn. Yep. Uh, and trust me, I've, you know, I do promise that all of the other um, uh, Brewers artifacts in the starting nine are Milwaukee Brewers related. This is the only non-Brewers artifact in that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, when going through it, just I when working on the starting nine, I couldn't pass up including this jersey. Uh, one, because it's so cool. Uh, two, because Warren Spawn is, you know, an incredible pitcher, player, you know everything, you know, he had, he had a great career. Um, so yeah, so this Jersey is actually from, uh, his final pitching, uh, day in the 1962 season. So mm -hmm. it was, uh, September 29th. Um, and yeah, so this is when he became, he earned his 327th career victory. So he passed Eddie Plank as the winningest Southpaw to become the winning winning winningest Southpaw. That's a weird word. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and I think he's held that record ever since, if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, so this is the jersey that he wore that game. Uh, you know, 
it was he had still and then he still played I think three more seasons. Uh, he uh, played until 1965, so he, <laughs> he racked up a couple more wins along the way. Um, but in 19 in 1962, when he wore this jersey, he actually led the big leagues uh, with the most complete games. So he threw 22 complete games, uh, which again today is unheard of. <laughs> so you need they had a lot more uh, rubbery arms back then, Bruce. Um, but uh, in this game, particularly, he also, again, went the, the full distance. Uh, the Braves beat the Pirates 7-3. to uh, And he even contributed a hit in the RBI to the effort. So wasn't wasn't just sitting back there on the mound doing his job. Yeah. He actually contributed off- offensively. Such a remarkable career in more than just baseball. Here was a guy who served in World War II, yeah. and he was one of the soldiers at the Battle of the Bulge. Yep, he served Which three years. Was for one sure. of the, the fiercest battles. Um, what those guys went through is almost unimaginable. Mm-hmm. He was there. He survived yep. it. Yep. And of course, he lost a number of years of his career. Kind of got a lot late start in baseball. Didn't really establish himself as a good mm-hmm. pitcher until his later 20s. Yeah. And yet he still was able to compile uh, 300 plus wins. It's just remarkable. It is. It's totally remarkable. Yeah, he, he uh, served in the Army for three years uh, and then came back to play baseball. So uh, absolutely incredible. Um, yeah. And he, and he still had a 21 year career. So, you know, it was not just, oh, 10, 10 years in the majors, not be two plus decades. Now, in terms of the artifact itself, it's interesting on a number of levels. And I think okay. we need to talk a little bit about what is on the, the the left sleeve or our right as we look at it, that is what was called the Screaming Brave. Mm-hmm. That was part of the Braves logo back then. That is, you know, something that would not be accepted today. No, nope, no, nope, uh, it's probably not something the Braves uh, are necessarily proud of in terms of what they once featured. But it does show that when we have an artifact here, uh, we display it, we maintain it. We maintain it in its entirety, even if part of it is offensive to some people, and this certainly is, it is still part of history. Uh, it's not something that we can start to take apart no. or cover up the logos that we don't particularly like. Uh, this, this, you, I guess you have to accept the artifact in its full capacity and then explain to people exactly why it's done that way. Exactly. And that's the, I mean, great part about being a, a museum that focuses on history is that we're, we're telling that history and, you know, and sometimes history is uncomfortable and sometimes, you know, choices that were made were not fantastic, but that's how you use it as a uh, learning, a learning point. And so how do you be better? And so that's, that's, you know, uh, that, and it's very cool to be able to see how logos like this evolved and how, you know, how teams recognize to do better. Yeah. You look at it too, um, while that aspect of the uniform has certainly changed over time, we still see a lot of the elements on the front of the jersey Mm -hmm. still in use by the Braves today. Yep. uh, In terms of the font, the red coloring. Um, What's different though about this one, this Spawn jersey from the early 60s, it is not a button down. It is a zipper, and I always find those interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, it's very neat to see how uniforms have evolved over the years, what uh, what baseball has chosen to, you know, to experiment with. Uh, and the zipper was one of them. And it was not, it didn't last a, a very long, um, it, pro- maybe a season or two on various teams, um, probably because it was a metal zipper. And I'm going to guess that did not feel super comfortable against the skin. Yeah. I'm going to guess that in the hot summer sun, that metal got quite warm. Uh, and so it just, uh, I think it slowly, de- you know, it, it became a part of history. It's no yeah. longer fashionable to use. And we went back to buttons. And also, I mean, think about, think about sliding or diving. Sure. On a zipper. <laughs> Ouch. Absolutely could go right up into the neck area. I think that's one of the main reasons why this was a trial and error. This did not work out for more than a few years for a few teams. I'm curious, Gabrielle, from a conservational preservation standpoint, 
Um, when you have a zipper, is that, I know that you're not you know, zipping it up and down all the time, but does that create difficulties in terms of preservation? Because zippers do tend to break. Yeah, I mean, the key, we try not to manipulate it too much. Um, and you just, you do it very carefully. You don't, and if it, you know, when you, you have your jacket, that's, it's not zipping or whatever, the teeth aren't matching. You don't just yank it. You, you just very carefully work, work on it. Um, I think uh, like for this, uh, the dummy for this photo that it's on, I would hazard a guess that it probably didn't need to be unzipped to be put on. Um, and so thinking about that and like trying to do those other steps to make sure you don't have to unzip it. Yeah. So the correct way is to keep it in its zipped position in terms of, of, of maybe the, the, the standard way and only unzip it if you absolutely have to. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would, I would say so. It, you know, try not to work it too much. Yeah. Um, zipper aside, it, it's, it's a wonderful piece. I'm amazed by so many of our uniforms, these wool uniforms, these flannel uniforms from yep. the 40s, 50s, 60s. It looks like it's in wonderful condition still. Oh yeah, I mean the flannel looks beautiful. Uh, it's it's great. It's definitely a different type of flannel than when you saw the you know twenties and thirties. That the flannel back in the in the twenties was a lot thicker. Yeah. Then uh, they, they definitely got a little thinner on the fabric. So, which I'm sure the ball players appreciated it in July. Yeah. At the bottom, you can see the Wilson tag uh, for the Warren Spawn jersey. Now, in terms of where this is being displayed, uh, it's from the 1960s, uh, so it could not be in whole new ball game, which is 1970, the current day. I'm guessing this is either in the timeline of baseball history on the second floor, or possibly, well, I guess possibly one for the books. I'm going to go with timeline, second floor. You are correct. All right. You're correct. You, you have a, a good batting average so far. Yeah, better than, better than usual. I'm not <laughs> usually uh, that sharp, but we're doing okay today. So that is Warren Spahn, Milwaukee Braves. Now we'll go to pure Milwaukee Brewers. They yep. became franchise 1970. Um, here we have one of their early stars, Robin Yount, who came up to the big leagues at the age of 19, became a standout shortstop, later a center fielder. Um, give us the specific story of this helmet. This is much later in his career. This it is. is it is. Um, yeah, he, well, I mean, you you can't say Milwaukee Brewers without Robin Yao. Uh, he was a brewer his entire career. Um, but yeah, this was from his 1982 season. So he wore this on, for 1982. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, 1989, not 82. Read that wrong. Uh, because this is the year that he won his second MVP award. Yeah. Um, and uh, his first was in 82. Uh, and, but what's interesting about this uh, MVP award is that he won this uh, for playing center field. His first MVP award was for when he was playing shortstop with the Brewers. So, which is really cool. I mean, uh, there's only, you know, before uh, Robin Yount, there was only two other players who had won MVPs at different positions. Uh, and then after him was so far, it's been only been one other person. Uh, so uh, Hank Greenberg and Stan Musial before him. And then after him was uh, Alex Rodriguez. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he had a, a, you know, obviously a really, really great career, a great season to be able to win an MVP. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was his 15th year in the big leagues. That's just, you know, to win an MVP that late in your career is pretty awesome. Yeah. A couple of things jump out about the helmet itself. The name Yount, uh, very clearly spelled out. Um, and it, that that nameplate doesn't seem to be chipping in any way. It's really in good shape. I think they're and just the little, little uh, letter stickers. They're the individual stickers. Okay. Yep. Very good. And then what I really love is the decal logo. Uh, yeah. This to me is the best logo the Brewers have ever had. Uh, yeah. Uh, the MB that looks like a glove. You just can't mm -hmm. beat this. Yeah, you, you really can't. I mean, it's just uh, the graphic designer who did this this logo uh, should get all the kudos for it because it's perfect to make it, you know, look like a, a glove and, you know, have be baseball-y but still have the the initials in it for the MB. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, when I was young, I like to tell friends that it was actually my initials, Bruce Markison, but they did not go for that. Of course, it was oh. MB, Milwaukee Brewers, um, <laughs> sort of similar to what the Montreal Expos uh, with their old uh, logo, which um, has, has a couple of different interpretations when you look at it, sort mm -hmm. of like this mm -hmm. does. It is both it is both a glove and it is the letters for the franchise, yep. uh, which makes it uh, which makes it really cool. Um, Robin Yount, 1989. So in terms of where this might be in our exhibits, I'm going to have to say it's in a whole new ball game, 1970, the current. And you are correct. All right. Ding, ding, ding. Yep. Okay. I promise I'm not cheating. I didn't I didn't look any of these up ahead of time. I did that with some of the old shows with Sheba and Odell just to try to impress them, but I didn't cheat this time. So oh, no, thanks. So if I, you know, <laughs> for when we do NL West, I got it. I, I, All right. I know you're Two more teams to do Gabrielle. Let's move on from the Milwaukee franchise to the Pittsburgh pirates. Uh, we saw the Jim Maloney glove earlier. Now we see a left-handed pitcher's glove. And this is a great story. This is the glove that Harvey Haddix used back in late May of 1959. Yep. When he pitched uh, a near perfect game, that's really not a perfect game. It's really not. It is one of the weirdest games to ever go down in Major League history, in my opinion. Um, it's just the ending was so bizarre. Uh, first of all, let's talk about Harvey Haddix and the fact that he went 12 innings throwing a perfect game, like 12 innings. Not nine, you know, not ten, not like twelve. And the, but then he lost it in the in the thirteenth, and that just, uh, it's that's a heartbreaker, first of all. Um, but you know, you have to, t you know, t you, you know, he's doing such a great job pitching, but at the same time, you know, his team, they were also getting shut out by Milwaukee at the same time, so they weren't scoring any runs. Um, so it wasn't until the thirteenth uh, inning that uh, eventually. Uh, it was a Pirates third baseman, Don Hoke, uh, booted a grounder. And so there goes a perfect game, first of all. Uh, but still, still no hitter. Uh, but so you have a guy on first. Uh, then Eddie Matthews from Milwaukee comes to the plate and does it and um, has a, makes a sacrifice bunt to move the guy to second. Uh, and then, uh, for whatever reason, they uh, intentionally walked Hank Aaron, um, who is next in the lineup. So you got first and second. Um, and then, and then that's when it all, you know, then he lost the game by giving up a home run to Joe Adcock. Mm. However, the score for the game was only one to nothing because for whatever reason, when Adcock hit the home run, Hank Aaron, I don't know, thought it bounced off the wall. I'm, I'm not really sure whether he thought it got caught. He didn't think it was a home run. He actually left the diamond. He walked back across the diamond to the dugout. and. So because Agcock passed him, Hank Aaron was out and Agcock was out. But thankfully at that point, Don um, Felix Mantilla, who was on the who was on the base paths, scored before Hank Aaron was called out. So that's how the game ended one nothing. It was it's absolutely the most bizarre way to end a game in the history yeah. of the big leagues. <laughs> you couldn't even you can't even write that. Yeah, it, it's a, it's amazing. It's somewhat reminiscent of. Um... Howard Johnson in a Mets playoff game hit a hit a game winning home run and he didn't complete his circuit around the bases because the winning run had already scored. So uh, in this case, it was not Adcock who wasn't running it out, but it was Aaron who just yep. you know assumed a victory, which they had. Yep. And it was just a matter of bookkeeping. Um, uh, maybe Adcock was upset with him after the game for denying him a home run. Uh, <laughs> but uh, hey. They won the game, and that was the bottom line. That was the most important yep. thing. And Harvey Haddix almost had a 13-inning perfect game. Almost. Now, there was a time, Gabrielle, where Major League Baseball did consider this a perfect game mm -hmm. because yep. he had the perfecto for the nine innings. Yep. So they kind of separated the extra innings. But that mm -hmm. rule was changed a number of years ago yep. to the point where now you have to have the no-hitter or the perfect game to the completion of the game. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, um, a great looking glove, um, mm -hmm. very old from the 1950s. I mean, we're talking more than 70 years ago. Yep. Uh, it is darkened quite a bit over time, but still looks to be in relatively good condition. 
Mm-hmm. Looks like a, it looks like it's a little smaller than the Maloney glove. I'm not sure about the scale, but it does look like it might have been a little bit, just not a little smaller, kind of typical of a 1950s glove. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you can tell with you know how big the thumb is, how thick and round that is. It's very uh, much of the time. Um, this is actually a Rawlings glove. I did look this up for you. Mm. Uh, I know you like to ask about that. Uh, so compare that to the McGregor glove of Maloney. Uh, yeah, they're slightly different styles, but about a decade apart. So yeah, it's a really good looking glove overall. I think it's also interesting that Haddix was willing to give up this glove <laughs> after a heartbreaking loss. He doesn't get the perfect game. His team yep. doesn't win the game. I mean, it's <laughs> Maybe just- he was like, I'm done with this glove. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> that may have been his philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Whatever the reason, he was very generous and did give this to the Hall of Fame. It's been here ever since. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to our, actually, before we go to the other pirate artifact, got to figure out where this, this has got to be one for the books. Oh, yeah. 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 Very easy. Good job. (laughs) Yeah, the perfect game that wasn't a perfect game, just as such strange circumstances. It's such a a good story for one for the books. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It makes perfect sense. That, That was too easy. All right, let's move on. This is one of my favorite players, uh, Mm -hmm. Willie Stargell. Used this bat during the 1979 World Series, but it wasn't actually his bat. No. Tell us the story. Tell us the circumstances. Yeah, so if you um, see, you can uh, make out the autograph, uh, the signature, not really autograph, on the bat. It's actually a Manny Singian model. Uh, So Willie Stargell used his teammate's bat throughout the entire 1979 World Series, which... You know, again, if he was having, you know, he felt he was hitting the ball real well, uh, and he did, because uh, in those seven games, he batted 400. He had three home runs. Uh, he also had uh, four doubles, seven RBI. Um, but he, he did really good with this bat. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, he also uh, set a, uh, tied a record for total bases. So 25 total bases, he tied uh, Reggie Jackson's total base record uh, in this series. Um, so yeah, Stargell had a fantastic World Series. He was uh, then, you know, clearly named World Series MVP. Um, this that came on the heels of he was also the National League Championship Series MVP. So he was just he had a a really good fall of 1979. <laughs> a couple of things that jump out here, Gabrielle. Willie Stargell and Manny Singian were two completely different hitters. Yeah, Manny was a singles doubles hitter, a slap hitter, did not mm-hmm. have a lot of power. I would imagine that his bat generally was lighter than Stargell. Stargell was known for using a club, a heavier bat. He was a slugger. He hit some of the longest tape measure home runs of the 1960s and 70s. So it's fascinating to me that you have Stargell borrowing mm-hmm. a bat, which is yep. probably lighter than his normal bat. But for I wish I knew what. Stargell's typical bat weight. I'm not, I didn't, I didn't think to check. Uh, this one's actually a pretty hefty bat. Uh, it's, it's a, it's 30, it's a 36 and a half inch bat, oh. uh, but it weighs 34 ounces. So it wasn't, uh, you know, super light. Uh, yeah. in my opinion. That is interesting. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, maybe because, you know, Sanguine was more of a slap hitter, he didn't need the he used the heavier bat to get into those slap hits. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's one thing I'm thinking about is that a typical Stargell bat might have weighed a couple more ounces, but you know, it's later in the season. Mm-hmm. Stargell's an older player. Yeah. Maybe he felt he needed a slightly lighter bat to get more bat speed. That might have been mm-hmm. uh, what was working here. Uh, other things that jump out about the bat uh, it's Hillerick and Bradsby, Little yep. Slugger. Yep. And it's a really dark bat. I don't know if yep. it's it's a if it was like that at the beginning or it became darkened through pine tar. But from that era, you didn't see a lot of bats this dark. No, um, but it's not painted as, you know, you get a lot of bats these days. Uh, I think it's just I think it's just stained that color. I don't think it's uh, pine tar. You can see a little bit probably okay. pine tar towards the handle. But obviously, you're not going to get pine tar all the way up the, the barrel. Um yeah, it's, I mean, it's still, it's still a good looking bat in that you can still see the wood grain, which is awesome when you work on photo matching things these days. Uh, the worst, the worst is tracking an all black bat uh, mm-hmm. because you can't see anything on it in, in video or photos. 
Now, is that tape at the end of the bat near the handle? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. So Sanguine apparently, um, well, maybe it was Stargill. I don't know. Maybe uh, yeah. maybe Stargill decided that he wanted to use a lot of tape. I'm not sure if that was typical of him. I'd have to look at photos and video. I'd have to, yeah. yeah and but it's not a ton of tape. It's, it's a little bit of tape, but, you know, that's just a little extra grip. Nothing crazy. Not an unusual amount. All right. Uh, in terms of where this is, I, I got to say it's Autumn Glory, third floor. You are correct. All right. Yep. So I got really working harder choices for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Um, I, I couldn't help but get that one right. All right, we've got one more team to look at, two more artifacts, and two more Hall of Famers. Mm -hmm. Gabrielle, let's start our St. Louis Cardinals venture with this completely looking, completely different looking bat, much lighter model. And mm -hmm. this was a bat, uh, goes way back to the 1960s, used by Stan the Man. Yeah, so uh, this bat is, is the one that Stan Musial used when he collected his 3,431st career hit to become the all-time National League's National League hits leader until uh, Pete Rose passed him in 81. Uh, but yeah, so uh, that this is the bat he used for that record-breaking hit. Uh, the record was previously held by Hannes Wagner, uh, who, you know, if you think about this, so, the, you know, this Sam Musial got his hit in 1962. Hmm. Honus Wagner had been retired since 1917. <laughs> So a good 40 years until that record got broken, which is, is pretty cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the, the record breaking bat, which is really cool. Um, it was, uh, he collected it while the Cardinals were playing the Dodgers. Uh, they beat them eight to one. Um, then over his Musial's 22 year career, he collected, you know, uh, a, a, over 200 more hits. So he ended his career with uh, 3,630 hits. Uh, 475 home runs and also a, a couple MVP awards. He, he collected three MVP awards, you know, no big deal. <laughs> a remarkably consistent player and mm -hmm. the guy I, I had a chance to meet uh, a few years up until his death. He was a regular attendee of Hall of Fame weekend. Oh, that's cool. Uh, he was great with the fans, signing autographs, playing the harmonica. And it wasn't just at the ceremony. It was at the parade on Saturday night. Uh, if he was out in the town, um, you know, and he had time, he would sign autographs for people. Uh, one thing that strikes me, Gabrielle, about the bat, it's it's almost a bright yellow. It really pops out at you. Yeah, I think that's just the finish of the bat. Um, but it's, you know, natural wood. Um, it's a Louisville slugger mm -hmm. also. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you want to compare the the two bats between uh, uh, Stargell's and or Sangian's and uh, this one, it's, yeah, they're, they're very different it's very cool yeah. so see how that's very now is that musial's name imprinted above louisville slugger yes okay. yes i believe yeah mm -hmm. so a bat from stan musial who had just such a consistent and phenomenal career over 22 year career with the cardinals 3630 hits 475 home runs and as gabrielle said three most valuable player awards Yet if you ever met him, you never have a sense of how great he was. He just wasn't a braggart. He was a humble, modest guy and really was not that big a guy. I mean, you wouldn't think yeah. of a guy his size hitting nearly 500 home runs. And yet he did. Uh, another Cardinal great. Sadly, we lost him last year. Lou Brock. Uh, here we have uh, batting gloves. And these were not necessarily the gloves used to steal a base, which we might associate with Brock. No, this has to do with a milestone at the plate. Yep. So just to make sure, this is only one batting glove. There is not a left hand. There's only the right hand. <laughs> uh, yeah. So he, uh, Lou Brock used, wore this glove uh, when he collected his 3,000th hit on August 13th, 1979. Uh, which is, you know, a tremendous milestone, as we all know. That's a, a crazy number of hits. Um, he uh, he actually got both his 2,999th hit and his 3,000th hit in the same game. Uh, the both were off of uh, Cubs pitcher Dennis Lamp. The uh, the first hit was uh, in the first inning, uh, and then the second hit, his fourth, his 3,000th hit was actually in the fourth where he hit a line drive right back to Dennis Lamp, uh, literally uh, <laughs> uh, line drive off him. Uh, it hit uh, Lamp's hand 
Uh, I think it, three of his fingers turned purple or, it, you know, swollen, et cetera. Yeah. He actually had to leave the game because of it. And so that's a, that's definitely a memorable way to collect your 3000. Yeah. By taking it out on the other pitcher. <laughs> now you wear batting gloves today. They are so much different than these rather primitive gloves from the late seventies. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, uh, there's much, a uh, much wider Velcro band, you know, you could get all kinds of extra wraps, you know, for your batting gloves, things like that. Um, I mean, the core thing is that it's a leather glove that you're, it helps, it helps you grip the bat, uh, is, is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Lou Brock only wore one glove while batting. Um, and it was only his, his right hand because he's a lefty. So bottom of the bat. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the glove from that hit. That's atypical for players today, right? Don't they usually wear two gloves? Yeah. Yeah. It's usually, yeah. It's very rare to see players without batting gloves today. Yeah. Uh, the R that you see in the middle on um, the, the back side of the glove is, I'm guessing, for Rawlings. You're correct. Yep. And uh, then you've got a, a pretty sizable strap there at the bottom of the glove, too. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely interesting how it's a little more adjustable in terms, like, if, um, for, you know, at least my batting gloves that I have, it's just one Velcro piece that you just try and wrap as tight as is comfortable, whereas yeah. that is a little more, you have a little more adjusting, which is interesting on that one with the Velcro. You know, gloves from this era, the 70s, even into the 1980s, really reminiscent of, of golf gloves. I used to work yeah. as a caddy uh, during the summers when I was in college. It was a great summer job. And you see the gloves that golfers wear very similar to something mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that, that's exactly right. It looks kind of just like a golfer's glove. So this is for the 3000 pit, 1979. So I'm guessing that this is in one for the books. I don't think I mentioned the Musial Bat. I think that's also got to be one. So I'm saying both of these Cardinal artifacts are one for the books. Nah, yeah, oh. I got you this time. They're all both right. in the timeline. Ah, all right. Yeah, yep. I was doing so well until mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. So for those not familiar, the timeline of baseball history is on the second floor. And it, it literally does go decade by decade. So you'll find uh, the Musial Bat in the 1960s section. And then in the 19, late 70s section, you will find the Lou Brock glove. So they're both represented in the timeline of baseball history. Yep. So those are our 10 artifacts representing the, the five teams in the National League Central, the Cardinals, the Pirates, the Brewers, also, asterisk, Milwaukee Braves, uh, Cincinnati Reds, and Chicago Cubs. Gabrielle, as always, it's been fun. Thank you for yeah. your insights. We do appreciate the time. Of course. Of course. Anytime. And I'll see you back here for the NL West. Excellent. And want to mention a couple of programs coming up before that. Our next virtual program is coming up in just two days. That's February 25th, this Thursday. And at a special time, note the time, it's 10.30 a.m. Eastern time, former major leaguer Curtis Granderson is going to be our guest. We're going to have him on for about a half an hour. We're going to talk about his career, maybe a little bit about his time playing for the nearby Oneonta Yankees or Oneonta Tigers, as the case was. Uh, we'll talk to him about his work with the Players Alliance as well. Curtis is a great guy. Um, he is, um, if he doesn't want to become a broadcaster, he could do a lot of things in baseball, but right now he's very active with the players Alliance. So he will be our guest 1030 to 11 o'clock this Thursday morning. And again, that's 1030 Eastern time. And then next week, March the 2nd. So that's next Tuesday. Our guest is going to be Sue Zappay. Sue is a former player in the all American girls professional baseball league. And she's very active in, in or kind of forming an organization for both not only old time players, but younger players, younger women who want to play the game of baseball. And it's something that could lead to the formation of a professional league. So it should be a very interesting conversation. That's next week, next Tuesday, March the 2nd, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so those are some of the programs that will be coming up. We still do have a couple of more programs uh, with our Artifact Spotlights our, uh, or our Starting Nine Artifact Spotlights, I should mention. Uh, we still do have a couple of divisions to cover there.
Uh, again, our thanks to Gabrielle Augustine for joining us. And of course, our thanks to the Ford Motor Company for being a generous sponsor and making these programs possible. Gabrielle, thanks again. We do appreciate it. Yep. It's good you to take see you. care, folks. Have a great day. Uh, we hope uh, to see you in Cooperstown sometime in the spring or summer. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. Take care now.